Thank you very much and welcome to Princess Lillian's Garden. My name is Lillian. Today, I would like to talk about what we do all the year concerning gardening. That is growing a successful garden all year round, wherever we are in the world. Maybe in the temperate regions, maybe in the tropics, that is, wherever you are, whether you're experiencing winter or you don't experience winter, or there's always snow all year long, you can still grow a successful, a beautiful, and a high yield garden all year long and this is what I intend to be discussing this evening you're welcome thank you so the first thing that we would need to consider is we need to learn what crops grow best in our area and these are the ones we would concentrate on initially. When we concentrate on the crops that grow best in our area, this will be an encouragement that will enable us to want to grow more in future. Because when you have crops growing, and they are suitable for that environment, they will grow very well. And this brings some confidence to your gardening. Thank you, welcome. This brings some confidence to your gardening when you're growing crops that are suited to your environment. How would you find crops that are suited to your environment? You can ask other people what they are growing. Thank you very much, Potted Gardening. You're welcome. You can ask what time they're growing it, depending on the time of the year. And then you get yourself a notepad and put down like the 12 months of the year that we have. You try to note down what is supposed to be grown in your area at different times of the year. This is a way of tackling uh, gardening. When you tackle gardening in a way that you grow the things that are suitable for the environment, the environment is actually in support of what you're trying to grow, your gardening will go successfully. Now, the second bit is there will still be a few things that cannot grow naturally in our environment. What we would now consider is building 
an enclosure. And that's where we have all these greenhouses and green tunnels popping up left, right, and center. This is to accommodate the crops so that we can put inside that space the type of environment that this plant wants to grow in. I will start with the example of tomatoes. Now, tomatoes would grow big and give its yield if it's growing in a warm environment. In most places, in the temperate region where we have winter, we don't have enough sunlight, enough sunny months for these tomatoes to grow and produce their fruits. We'd have the sunny months for about four months. So if you started your tomato, when it becomes warm enough, you would only be able to get maybe one of two tussles of crop of your plant. But what we do to overcome that as gardeners is we start our crops indoors. And that's why you see a lot of people we start tomatoes maybe around late February, early March. So that these tomatoes will be growing indoors for about eight to 12 weeks before they are finally placed outside in May when it becomes warm enough. One way in which we can place our tomatoes outside earlier than late May is to build a greenhouse. When we have a greenhouse built, this will mean we have an enclosure that is very suitable to the existence of our tomato plant. Our tomato plant can survive in that enclosure, although it's very cold outside. The temperature within can be controlled in a few ways. You can use some electrical heating or you can use some solar heating. And a few people nowadays use compost heat because at some point compost will start to generate heat for it to break down properly. Some people use compost heat to keep their greenhouses warm. So these are different ways of keeping the tomatoes in the perfect temperature they would like to be for them to be producing well. Temperature would like, I mean, tomatoes would like to be growing in a temperature that is convenient for us indoors. That's why it's easy for us to have these tomatoes growing indoors. Because that's just the temperature the tomatoes need. If tomatoes needed a temperature that was like cooler than what we live in, then we wouldn't be able to heat our houses during those cold months. But we are already heating our houses. We have a temperature of between 22 and 24 degrees centigrade indoors. This means it's convenient and possible for our tomatoes to also grow during this time. Whereas if we place them outside, it will be another eight to 12 weeks before they start germinating by themselves. These methods are what's employed all over the world to enable gardens to run successfully. We would have some gardens that are big business gardens, big corporation gardens, but nowadays we have individuals running 
their own small greenhouses on their allotments and it's working well. You'd find a lot of crop that wouldn't be growing because it's cold outside. Once they are growing it within the enclosure of the greenhouse, these crops start to grow very well. The advantage of being able to do this is that we will get our plants to maturity and by the time the warm weather now arrives properly, all they have to start doing is to start fruiting. So if you planted your tomato seeds indoors in February, end of February, or let's just say on the 1st of March, and it takes a week or two to germinate and come up with the two leaves, the seed leaves. After that, in three weeks time, by the time you're getting to the middle of um, April, it will have more leaves coming out and it starts to grow to a height that this tomato is big enough to put outside. But it's still cold outdoors. So we keep it indoors and allow it to keep growing maybe on our windowsill, on a side table, in a bathroom window. There are so many places we can place this in small pots and they will grow and carry on living. This way of starting plants indoors is not limited to tomatoes alone. You can do it for peppers, vegetables like kale, spinach, broccoli, just right across the board. The one important factor is growing them in temperatures that they can successfully grow in. And to be able to do this, it means we need to understand each of the plants we are interested in growing. If you are interested in growing onions, you need to understand a bit about the nature of onions. So you spend a few minutes trying to understand that onions will grow, start growing in cold weather, and they will keep growing until it gets warm and they get big. Tomatoes would only start growing when the weather is warm. But what you can do to overcome that is you can grow the tomatoes indoors. When you grow the tomatoes indoors, the weather is already warm. So the tomato has no issue with, oh, it's still winter. It's indoors, so you start it. Now, so people will say to me, why don't we just start our tomato in December then? And my response is, big corporations, big gardens that would have the space to accommodate tall to tomato plants can start their tomato seeds anytime, year round. And I've seen it, and it just keeps growing. But if you are an individual gardener and you've got your greenhouse, you don't want to put in all the cost of heating that greenhouse or having a green plant growing inside your kitchen, trying to flower and fruit. Because when the tomatoes grow tall and they're ready to flower, the amount of light that we have naturally indoors would not be sufficient. You'd have to get a grow light or several grow lights at that, not just one. So what is best practice is to try and start it when you know it will soon be able to go outside. Or even if it's not going outside, it will soon be good enough weather so that you're not using so much money to heat the greenhouse, you're not using so much money to light the grow lights. 
to keep the plants going. Because when a plant is fruiting, it needs a lot of sunlight. It's got to carry out photosynthesis to be able to store up food in the fruits. That's why tomatoes don't grow quickly in the winter. And when you go into your garden, and not just early spring, when it's late spring, you start seeing tomatoes just springing up. That is the natural temperature for them to germinate. So sometimes in my garden, after I have tried to grow maybe about um, 10 or 15 or 20 tomatoes indoors, running around after it, looking after it as if, because it's not going to survive if I don't look after it. And then it's been growing for like eight weeks from March, April, then in the middle of May, I take it outside and put it in my garden. A week or two later, right before the end of May, I've start seeing some tiny two leaves germinating and growing out of the soil. This is because the perfect weather is now here. So the tomatoes can start growing at that time. So it's not that the tomatoes cannot grow here naturally, but the time they will start growing outside, winter will already be around the corner. Because if a tomato starts to germinate in May, it takes another eight weeks for it to start flowering. We are already in July, end of July, another week or two to form fruit, to ripen. So the first set of tomatoes you get off such, you will probably be harvesting in late September. By October, the tomato garden is already on its way out. So you are not going to get a lot of harvest from a tomato that actually grows by itself outside. This type of tomatoes are called volunteers. I get them a lot every year. And if I see anyone growing in a convenient position, I just put a stick there, tied to the stick and support it, and it will grow. But I know I won't be getting more than two or three trussles of it. That is why we need to help our tomatoes. We give them a head start from earlier in the year by growing them indoors, either in trays or in small pots. And then by the time the temperature is now convenient, we put them outside. We don't want to wait until when the temperature is convenient to start going to get them. So if you want to grow a successful garden year round, you don't wait until May to go to the garden shop to get your seeds. This is the best time to get your seeds. You need to get your seeds in winter, either in December or January. You get your seeds, you have them, you get your soil, you have everything in mind, what you're going to do in February. Because when February comes to an end, you should have your seed, your soil, everything in place. And you start planting your seeds. You can plant your pepper seeds, your um, tomato seeds, and so many other ones that like the warm weather. You can plant them indoors and after they've been with you for about eight weeks to ten weeks, they will be growing to a height of above one feet. That's like 30 centimeters. That's about the time you want to take them out and plant them outside. Because yes, it's all right to keep indoor plants inside because they don't have a high requirement for sunlight. So you want to keep indoor plants indoors, that's all right. They can grow indoors successfully. Hello and welcome. Thank you.
they can grow indoors successfully because they don't have a high requirement for sunshine. But those plants you're growing that have a high requirement for sunshine, like tomatoes and peppers and even fruit trees that you might have started indoors, they need to be placed outside. Unless you are living in a place where entirely you don't get much sun, then you'd have to be using grow lights. These grow lights will probably even out after a few years of producing tomatoes with them because you don't have to keep buying them every year if you look after them properly. So the cost will even out. But you first of all have to do the outlay in the first year. And also, you'd have to consider where you're going to place those plants for them to grow indoors is definitely going to have to be a form of a tunnel or a greenhouse, depending on how cold your location is. How hostile, because there are places as well that it's actually not too cold, it's too hot for the tomatoes. So it needs to be in a cool, shaded place, away from the sun that is too hot. Because when the sun is too hot, it actually prevents tomatoes from setting fruit. So if you have a situation where your tomato is now in good weather, it's all warm, if it gets warmer than a certain temperature, if it's higher than 30 degrees centigrade, when um, pollination takes place, and you have the pollen grain has been transferred because you can go there and flick your flowers. The bees will come along and land on your flowers and all your plants are getting pollinated. But what will happen is the fruit that will be formed will be so small and then you will start to wonder. That is because those fruits did not get fertilized. As the pollination occurred, Fertilization was not allowed to take place because the enzymes are denatured when temperature is too high. When you have a heat wave, the enzymes will be denatured so that pollination cannot very well take place. Pollination will be slowed, I mean, um, fertilization will be slowed down. Even pollination, the bees will come along, they will pollinate, but it will not result in big fruits because pollination is not allowed to take place. It may start, but it won't just bring large tomatoes for you. It won't bring large peppers for you. And one thing I've noticed as well is that the ants like it when it's sunny and dry. So when you are having a heat wave, the ants will just be on, hiding under the leaves and walking around. So in a heat wave, we should try and water our garden appropriately to make sure there's no dry pockets for the ants to be able to be doing all their own activities and preventing our plants from growing successfully. The one thing that ants do that is not good for our garden is that they age aphids. Ants aid aphids up your plants because when the aphid penetrates your plants and feeds and sucks on your plants, then the ants will take their poo. When the aphids now poo, it's a sugary poo. The ants would like to feed on that. So they've seen this as a way of let's just have this aphid here and will be feeding off their waste. So if they took just one or two aphids off your plant, you will suddenly see so many aphids on your plant one morning. So it only takes one aphid to create all those ones surrounding a small portion of the plant because the ants know that the aphids will reproduce and they can just hang around and be feeding off all the waste that is coming out of them. That is one reason why we want to discourage ants. Because ants also help in pollination. But 
what they do alone is like having a good side, but also they're doing something that's not beneficial. That's one reason why we don't want the ants in our gardens because they keep aiding aphids to help damage the garden. Aphids like to gather around the stems of flowers, the stalks, and they will suck the juices out of the flowers of any plant. So if the flower of a plant has been damaged, that is where I'm supposed to be producing food from. Even when aphids stay on the stem, they stay on the younger leaves. So if the younger leaves on anybody's plants are getting damaged, that is also not good. If the aphids will just stay on some leaves that are about to fall off, maybe we will not bother, but they will like to stay on those leaves that are supposed to be carrying on for the future of the plant, for supporting the footing that is going on. So when you have aphids, they terribly disturb the garden. We do not notice this a lot as we do other pests because what they are attacking is like the beginning before the fruit is even formed they are already attacking the flower so a lot of times we don't notice this but they help reduce the size of our harvest they reduce the size of the tomatoes they reduce the amount of the tomatoes we are going to get if we have aphids in there and if you have aphids walking up and down and ants walking up and down in your tomato garden, they will soon bring blight. Blight is a disease that it's a fungal disease that affects tomatoes. And the way it works is that there will be all these microorganisms in the soil, but your plant is growing and it's not touching the soil. If you now have some organisms walking around from the soil to your plant, they will carry some of the infection and your plant will be infected. And the second way your plant will be infected is when you're watering, if your plant's leaves are getting splashed on, then your productivity will reduce because if the plants have blight, early blight, that is from an early stage, maybe right from when they started flowering, they already started having these black patches on the stem. They are not going to be able to produce very large fruits. Those are things that we need to keep in mind and take care of and try to prevent. Because when this comes along and happens in our gardens, then it's discouraging. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of thinking, oh, I'm going to, going to get rid of this pests that I have in my garden. But if we already understand how they all work, we can circumnavigate and overcome them with, with, with before they even gain any, any strength. You see the ants, they're trying to move around in your garden. You try to avoid this. You prevent this. There are many ways in which you can do this to keep your garden soil well watered, keep it moist, and then look around your garden floor, sweep up places, even if, if you're going on concrete, sweep up the places, make sure there are no corners around where you have ants just sticking out of the wall and joining your garden as, as if they belong there. That is one way. If you are going directly in the ground, then make sure leaves that are falling around are swept up so that you can have a footpath and you will be able to see any nooks and crannies where ants can just be developing their heel and sticking out and making their journey towards your garden. This will allow you to be able to find where the ants are coming from if you have them in your garden. Because having ants in the garden prevents us from having a very good harvest. Because they bring aphids. The aphids ruin 
the plants. If you don't have aphids and you now have, I mean, if you don't have ants, that is, you've taken care of the ant by keeping the entire environment well swept, leaves and bits and pieces that can attack them have all been thrown into some soil, buried it, make it into a kind of a trench um, composting. Only soil should be appearing and the stones that you have to work on within the garden. Then the ants won't have a leg to stand on. One way, if you actually have ant problem that you want to deal with, is to use borax mixed with sugar. So you would take this borax, mix it in water, it's water soluble, and then you will take sugar and put it in water as well. You put it in small bottles and leave it in your garden. It will attract the ants. When the ants come along, they will probably drown in the sugary liquid, or if they don't drown, they will go back to their ant hill where they all stay and it will affect the rest of them so it will reduce the number of ants going up and down in your garden. This means it reduces the number of ants that are able to carry aphids all around in your garden. Because when you see ants, we just overlook them. Oh yes, I even always don't mind ants being around in my garden. But this makes me to keep an eye out if I see the ants, I will start looking at all the nooks and crannies on my plants when I'm out there. I'm trying to see if they've carried any aphids up, and I do see sometimes. If you go there early in the morning, you will see this black patch surrounding maybe the, the stalk of a flower or the stem of a young set of leaves that is coming out. If that's a lot of aphids, probably have to cut off that flower. I had some of them on my um, dahlia flowers, which I had to cut off. If there are not many of these aphids, these black patches, that um, you can use tissue and water and just wipe it off. Don't wash it off, because if you wash it off, they fall back into your garden soil and they will come back up again. You want to make sure you completely get rid of those aphids because having aphids sucking the juices out of your plants is one sure way of reducing the, 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 the beauty of what you're going to be harvesting as your crop. It's going to definitely reduce it because if you have just a few aphids and you are overlooking it, within two weeks, they will multiply so many because they, 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 there will be so many of them all over the place because the ants will now start thinking, oh, this garden is not looked after. They will take some of the aphids from one place and go to another um, corner um, on, 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 on your plants and start with that aphid. That aphid will also lay eggs and before you know it, overnight, it's usually early in the morning when you come out that you will catch a lot of these aphids all grouped together and looking black. Then you can decide what you want to do with it, depending on how important that specific stem is to your plant. And if your plant has only two stems, then you can't cut it off. You will have to wipe it. So you put tissue in water and wipe it and try to make sure the aphids don't fall on the, on the garden bed. You can lay a piece of paper and do that enough. You can lay a piece of so any one of them that falls off, it falls into the paper. And even some of the ants will fall into the paper. You can get rid of all of them. But getting rid of all these little things that we can overlook from our garden actually would help our garden to be successful year round. And what we need to take note of is if there's a side of the garden that is a bit shaded, you need to look more often at the plants that are on the shady side because that is the side where aphids like to concentrate and grow and ruin the garden.
The next thing is there are some other pests as well that like to ruin our garden. When we are trying to have soil that is rich, that's good for earthworms, they also attract slugs. The slugs are not a friend of the gardener at all. Yes, a lot of the times you say, oh, slugs help to break down compost, but then after they've helped to break down the compost, that's where that relationship ends. When you put your soil into your garden bed, you want to make sure you are able to recognize the slugs so that when you recognize these slugs, you can pick them up and bin them or put them together in one place and the birds can come and feed on them. But the important thing is being able to identify these slugs even when they are sleeping. Because if you want to catch the slugs when they are awake, it's a bit of an effort. They usually awake at night. They wake up maybe um, around night, nightfall when the sun is going down. That's when they are waking up. They are nocturnal. You may have a few days, you go out, you pick them, but they look bigger than they really are when they are uh, awake. It's, it is not being very attractive to pick. If you are able to identify the slugs while they are asleep, they will usually look very small, much smaller than they really are. You can pick them, you pick them out of your garden beds, out of your pots, out of the ground. If you pick the slugs severally over a period of about three days or the fourth day, you won't find a lot of slugs to, to pick. This will keep your garden safe as well, and you would have a successful garden for that period. One specific plant that slugs like to attack is strawberries. When you're growing your strawberries, thank you very much for the like. I yeah, really appreciate you. When you're growing strawberries, it's looking nice. You have the leaves, everything is growing. You have the flowers, yellow and white, and it's looking pretty. And then it starts to turn into food because it's the flower that's going to turn into food when it's been pollinated. Now, you're supposed to be having your fruits. Everything looks green. The slugs will pretend as if they're not around. Now, wait for your strawberries to start ripening. And the slugs come along and they're latching onto your strawberries and they only need to take a bite. The strawberry is ruined. So for this reason, I specifically concentrate on picking out the slugs from my strawberry bed. I pick out all the slugs from my strawberry bed just to ensure I don't have slugs around in there. Just to ensure that when I'm growing my strawberries, they are able to give me a good yield for my effort for putting that into the soil, putting it in good soil and watering it and placing it in, in a good location for the sun. All of these things have to be added together to see that we are gaining from our efforts. We, we are better off for our efforts. And all year round, you are able to, to grow something in your garden. The strawberry likes the same soil as the tomatoes. That is fertile soil that is very rich in humus. But a lot of the times, strawberries just fruit for one month. That is usually in June. That's why strawberries are called June bearing. You have a whole set of varieties of strawberries and they all fruit in the month of June. But then there are some. They have a wider range. They will fruit from June to August. That is June, July, August. So in your garden, you may have just one type or you may have the two types. So that is why some of them will have finished fruiting and you see that some are still fruiting. That's because they are different types of strawberries. So you need to allow 
the one that's only fruiting for a short while, to fruit for its own short while, and try to create more of the one that is fruiting for a longer period. Because we all want, I mean, it's the same plant, if it's going to carry on fruiting, you want it to carry on fruiting for the next three months. That's one thing I like. Right now, my strawberries only fruit for one month. But I'm looking forward to receiving some strawberries that I see that fruit for three months. That's a very good one to have in our garden. And then we are growing year long if you have those three months and you have strawberries. Another form of berry that we can have, we also have uh, blueberries that we can grow in our back garden. And they would also fruit for about six weeks and and that's it but you would know that during that period you're getting your black your blueberries blue sorry blueberries the soil that we would use to plant strawberries and tomatoes is the same but when you want to plant blueberries it needs acidic soil in fact the soil needs to be tested. We need to ensure that the soil is acidic. How do you create acidic soil? With a lot of organic material, it turns up as acidic. You can buy that kind of um, um, litmus test that is used, pH test that is used. You just take some of your soil and then you test to see the acidity. The blueberries, love acidic soil that's the difference between them and other plants mainly so you want to concentrate and keep in mind if you want to grow good blueberries because if they're grown in soil that is not very acidic to their taste the blueberries will be mushy and they won't taste sweet that's just the difference it will grow it will fruit but it won't taste very nice and it won't be very firm but if you want it to grow and you want it to be very tasty, like how blueberry is supposed to taste, you need to give it very acidic soil. It will work out well. Now, we have one other thing, and that is blackberries. Blackberries usually grow in the wild, and they have some tiny seeds. You eat the blackberry along with the seed. In fact, almost every community, every neighborhood. Thank you very much, Angela. This is this. You're welcome. I appreciate you. Now, you see that blackberries grow around in laybys, in um, little bushes, everywhere around. Blackberries are just something you can add to your garden. You don't have to bring it and come and plant it in your garden because there's a lot of it growing in the wild. But if you have acreage, a lot of space, you can grow a blackberry bush and it will yield for you year in, year out. And the blackberries give their fruits for about four months. That's between June and October, blackberries are still fruiting. That means you can keep going there. But if you're harvesting it heavily or you're not harvesting it, that's what's going to de determine how much of the blackberry that you're going to, to get. Because it will flower properly if, if you, you put it in a very sunny place. And when you start harvesting it properly, the younger ones, because there will be some that will talk, just remain as flowers. If you've harvested it, those ones will get a chance to mature. If you leave your blackberries and the blackberries are just on it and they're falling they're, they're falling off without you harvesting it, the younger ones will not get the energy to mature. Nowadays, there have been a few crosses of blackberries. There's the tea berry. I grow that in my garden because although it looks very much like the blackberry, it is actually seedless and it's redder. The blackberry is actually black when you pick it. It has to go from green to red to black. 
But when you pick it and you eat it, you see that it is red. It's very deep red that's inside. The tay berry, the logan berry that are crosses of blackberries that we can grow in our gardens because they are seedless. They are bigger. The fruits are bigger and the, 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 the fruits are, are redder. But it will still look a bit like black, but if you, you can actually recognize a logan berry or a tay berry from a blackberry because the blackness will be a bit different. The blackness of blackberry is entirely black. But if you have a bowl of um, tay berries, you see that a few of it is trying to still show for some, some redness after it has matured completely and it's gotten soft. The only thing with the tay berry and is that you, you can't get it to buy in the shop because it's very tender. It's some fruits that as soon as you harvest it, you can't be packaging it in any um, careless way. It's not readily available at supermarket, but some people will probably order it and they get it from farmers markets. That's one way. But if you are growing it and you're looking for a sort of blackberry to grow, the tay berry is a very good one to grow. When you put it in the soil after buying it from the shop, or after receiving a cutting from another gardener, it will grow in the following year and then flower in the second year. So that is 18 months, that's not 24 months. You get it one summer, it will not flower the following summer, but it will flower, start flowering and you will see that it will flower every year for the next 15 to 20 years. When we are growing these berries, it's important for us to have stakes in place because they are very heavy. And when they are properly staked, they flower more and produce more fruits for us. We also need to take note of one thing. The tail berry is not covered in um, thorns like the normal blackberry. Because those are all the things that make it not very welcoming for people to grow blackberries in their spaces. It's the thorns that it has. But the tea berry has taken care of that. It has a smoother body. You may still find a few thorns here and there, but it's much um, safer for because children like to pick um, berries and things like that. It's much safer for the children to to find the, the tea berry and pick and just live on it and enjoy it rather than to be picking the blackberries. When we go out blackberry picking, you would have to like, keep an eye on the, oh, don't stay there, don't stay there because you don't want them to fall over the blackberry bush. But with the tea berry bush, you have this in your garden and that is something that you can be harvesting from around, um, May to June. It's also longer than the strawberry. And one thing that I see as an advantage, although they don't taste the same or anything, of blackberries, of tay berries over my strawberries is that it's less stress. Because considering the strawberries and the slugs, I'll tell you how I overcome the slug issue. But considering the strawberries and the slugs, the slugs don't trouble your tail berries. That's one thing. They can't even climb it. So that's an advantage. If you have a berry that you can grow and the slugs will not climb on it, then that's very good. And my friend is offering me, it's just because of this lockdown, I've not been able to get it. He's offering me a, a, a kind of berry as well. I think it's the gooseberry. And that also grows in a way where slugs don't fancy growing up it. So when we have these berries, we can have a successful garden all year long because they won't take a lot of space, but they will be producing in their own time. And when you're um, harvesting peppers, you're harvesting um, strawberries, you're harvesting tea berries, 
you know that you are having a lot of foods over over the year as it's going on and you may also have food freeze that's not what we're discussing today but smaller shrubs that produce food those are the ones that i want to concentrate on we have them all year long we have them being in good condition because i've mentioned the ants we prevent the ants prevent the aphids and they live and produce a lot for us to harvest. In the case of having um, slugs on our uh, strawberries, what you do after picking the slugs is I mulch it. You have to heavily mulch the base of your strawberry bed because the strawberry has a very short stem. I have that on one of my videos. It has such a short stem that the slugs can easily get to the fruits when they are formed. Because the fruits are born on the stem, the leaves are born on the stem. But remember that the leaves are not so heavy, so they remain upright. But the fruits, maybe about six fruits on one stem, another six on the other side. So there may be about three on that single strawberry plant. And you have about um, 10 or 15 fruits. That little stalk will no longer be pointing the strawberries upright. It will now stay down in the garden bed. And that is one reason why we need to mulch the garden bed. In the olden days, everybody mulched it with straw. And that's why it's called strawberries. But nowadays, not everyone has access to straws. In the olden days, because of the horses, the cows and everything, there was always straw around. So they would just have straw available. And it's the best place for the strawberries to grow. Nowadays, that we don't all have straw around, you'd have to, I use pine needles from the Christmas uh, trees. We also have some pine trees down the road. I've got a few uh, other gardeners. They just cut some branches off the pine trees and lay it under the, the, the pine or under the strawberries. And when it starts to fruit, it cannot get in. Some people use wood clippings or wood shavings and they put it underneath. And all of these things, even some people use cloth, just to make sure the slugs that are in the soil, after you've picked the major big ones that you see, the ones that are left are discouraged from coming up because the surface they will meet will be very dry and slugs don't like working on dry surfaces. They like to be working on a wet soil. So you don't want the soil or your strawberry pot or bed to be wet and damp, but you still need wetness for the plants. So what you do in this situation is have mulch on it to keep the wetness in, to keep the slugs in, to discourage them from coming outside. They will stay in there and live their lives because the slugs can actually stay in there and not come out. It's when they have this opportunity of the soil is wet, they can walk around, that's when they come out. If the soil is not conducive for them, they will stay underground and they won't come up. Just like the earthworms, you don't find earthworms walking around all over the place. But because these slugs are seeing soil, they want to be walking on top of the soil and going around and damaging the strawberries. But if a slug just takes one bite out of a strawberry, that strawberry is already ruined. And that is a strawberry that you're already looking forward to. You saw it flowering, you saw it fruiting, you saw the fruit get big. And now that it's ripe, the slug gets there before you because they walk around overnight and feed on all the plants that they choose. 
we just want to avoid this sort of thing happening. So to have this successful garden, we need to get rid of all those things that are trying to trouble and prevent the garden from picking up and going nicely. We have some other pests that trouble the strawberries. There's the um, spittle bugs. There's, we have aphids and mites also troubling, but their own is not so obvious because the time that they are troubling the plant, maybe when it's the leaves, you see some mites on the leaves, then they stay on the stem. The spittle bug also troubles it a lot. I will explain that after the mites. They stay on the, on the leaves. You don't really notice what the mites and the, 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 the other ones, other insects are doing because they are affecting it at a point where it's not yet very mature. They are not actually affecting the fruit. But <clears throat> we should take, excuse me, you should take note of getting rid of them as well by maybe you want to use them or, or you want to just clean them off. That's what I do. I just clean them off. And when I've done that, I see that their number reduces a lot because the floor of the bed is actually dry from the mulching. Now, the spittle bug larva is laid in a crotch of the flowering bunch. When the strawberry flowers, if they come out in a bunch of about five or six, the adult spittle bug will go there and lay an egg. When this egg matures and it opens and it forms into a larva, this larva will be producing some kind of white foam so that it doesn't get dry. This larva is actually piercing the flowers and it may actually affect that branch. If that larva has like maybe two or three other companions and there's three of them laid in there, then you have to know that the strawberry that is supposed to grow in that place will not come out successfully because the larva would have fed on all the juices. Because that's what it's doing. It's feeding on the plant while it's there. And this does not bode well for the success of the plant. So when I see the spittle bug on my strawberry, I just use a tissue and I just take it out. It's usually green and it will be right there in the middle of the spittle. So when you're growing strawberries, you look on the flowers during the time when it's flowering. You look on the flowers, in the crotches of the flowers. If you see any soapy, bubbly, white thing, there's a pest inside. You need to take note of that and pick it out. The next thing that we need to do to ensure, thank you very much, <laughs> the success for our garden is when it's springtime and the plants are just coming up and they're starting to grow. Apart from picking out um, weeds, we should be looking under our perennial plants. The plants that live, that were not um, gone away, that they lived through the winter. They were winter hardy. For example, I have some yucca plants in my garden. I have some geraniums. They stay alive during the, the, the winter. The irises, they stay alive. The blades are all out there during the winter. We should look under these plants, look at the side away from the sun. You are looking for the larva of butterflies because a lot of butterfly moths will lay their eggs. And then when it's springtime and it's starting to get warm, the eggs hatch and you see the larva just attached to, to your plant, piercing the skin of the leaves and feeding on it. Now, that's not the only thing. They will now go on to start eating up the leaves. They do that a lot for strawberries. You see the lava that the eggs have been laid on the strawberry 
it now breaks open, becomes a lava, and the lava starts to eat the strawberry. This would affect the production level of that plant. Because if there was three lava from on, on one plant, that is if you actually have a lava, a butterfly lava infestation, they can take down the entire production of, of your garden and the garden will not be successful for the plant strawberry that you have because those ones have been overcome by by, by butterfly lava. So the butterfly lava actually outright eats the leaves that the plant is supposed to use. Apart from eating strawberry leaves, Kale is one plant that butterfly lovers like to attack. When you have your kale, you want to keep an eye out and be sure you don't have butterfly flying around laying their eggs. Now, when I grew my kale, I had some butterflies around, but I just thought, oh yeah, let them... The kale was ready for harvest. And the person who had told me about the kale said, you just leave it outside, harvest a bit over the weeks and things. So that was what I did. When the kale was matured, the leaves were big enough for me to harvest. I just went there and harvested only the biggest leaves. I left some of the smaller leaves that were actually big enough for me to harvest. I went there and did that. And then I did it about three times. And then at some point, I started seeing holes. And I knew I had to take a look again. When I took a look at the butter, at, at, the, at the kale, there was like two or three different types of butterfly uh, varieties just in their lava on the, on the kale. And they were all eating up my kale. So what I have in mind now is when I'm growing my kale, I either grow it with a net, there's no growing of kale where there's no netting. You have to make sure your kale, your spinach, green leafy vegetables are netted. That's the best way to grow green leafy vegetables and have peace of mind. Do the netting with a hook. That is, you have one bar and turn it and then you put the net over. Or you can do it with a cage that is four sticks and then you place two and place another four on top and have the net around and then now you use it to cover your garden bed and you knock it into the ground but with that one we'd have to consider getting it all and but you have to figure out how to assess it with any kind of netting that you do but the best way to have successful growing of green leafy vegetables is to have netting. If you are still growing green leafy vegetables without netting, you will be having like a 50-50 because you can get there one day and they've eaten up your entire uh, garden. Just poking holes. They may not, they won't eat the whole leaf. That's just it. I mean, if I saw the butterfly lava in my garden and they just stayed in one corner and ate two leaves as a total. I would not worry. But one will eat uh, two holes into this, another one will eat two holes into that and oh, they will just be tasting everything. I'm not growing the garden for the butterflies to come and eat. So they grew the kale for you. The best way to grow kale broccoli, all those leafy vegetables, is to have netting on top of it, and you can just have some rest. Before I got the netting, what I did was, as soon as my kale was matured, I just cut it entirely. I harvested the entire top of the, the kale, and it grew again, which was the beautiful thing. It grew two new heads, and I was like, oh, you've grown back. That was beautiful. But if you leave your kale out there, 
and you only harvest the large ones and you leave the tiny ones, the butterflies will come along, they will feed on it, and that will be the the the, the wind of beautiful green leaves that you have. You want to ensure a successful garden year round by having a net when you are growing green leaves with the vegetables. If it's an entire allotment, use hoops on each portion. You can have an entire long row and it will be netted over, it will be under hoops because you just need to, pro to protect what you are producing from being eaten by unexpected um, pests. When you are using the netting for a vegetable bed, green leafy vegetables, one thing that I've noticed is you also have to consider it will be warmer in there and then maybe some slugs will start coming out because it's not only butterflies that we have trying to eat up our vegetable gardens, slugs as well. So you have to work out a way, maybe you pick out the big slugs. If you pick out the big slugs over a certain number of days, there will be a reduction in population of slugs and your garden bed can grow to a successful point where you can harvest before they get big again to start attacking your crop. But a lot of the times, those two things affect our garden's successful production. The butterflies laying their egg, but you can overcome that with the net. But the use of net encourages slugs because the place will be cozy. So you want to be available to pick out some of the bigger slugs. Make sure there aren't any hidden corners. Like if you have something that has a, is it called a lip? If you, um, if you have something that has a lip, like something on the outer part, if it has a lip like this, you need to check under all these places you may use a, a stick. You may use a stick to go around it. And if there are slugs, because that's what they do, they camp near your plant. They don't go away. They camp nearby. They come out at night. They eat your crop. In the morning, they go out. They camp nearby again. They don't actually go somewhere far. They stay up. Thank you very much, Kaki Lily. You're welcome. I remember you. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they camp near your plant and come out and eat it. And then when it rains, when it rains during the day, if you're not like too cold or something, that's another opportunity to go out and get rid of those slugs because they come out walking when it rains. That's the only time they come out during the day because the ground is wet and everything. You can just take a walk through your garden with a, a little bowl and a little thing to pick them up. And you can just be picking them and throwing them in the bowl. And you know you've reduced some of the um, snail population that you have in your garden. Now, some people talk about having organic slug pellets. If there is no way out, then you may use those. But if something is going to kill slugs, it will kill earthworms. And if it kills earthworms, I'm sure it's going to kill some other organisms as well. That's why anything that is like a pesticide that kills pests will also kill other organisms that are not pests. Because it's not going to say, oh yeah, you, you are a slug, I'll kill you. You, you are an earthworm, I won't kill you. It will kill all soft-bodied organisms. That's one reason why we want to reduce the use of these things. Now, at some point, 
I bought one just to see how it works. And what I did was I put it outside my garden fence because I'm like, there's a forest on not far away. So I'm sure this slot that I'm seeing that are big, probably coming from somewhere. And then I put it in a perimeter so that it's not even inside. And I think it deterred some of the slugs. But what we have to consider is that this thing is going to get washed into the waterways, the waterways of the earth that we live in. And it's a pesticide. It's going to be killing some organisms. Those are things we need to consider. And for that reason, I don't use it a lot. But if you have a large green veg organization and you just have to use it, just use it with care. Use it with the instructions. Don't just pile the pellets because on the instruction on every slug killing container that I read in, in, the, in the garden shop, it says put it down maybe like um, three in a meter square uh, space or four. That's how it, that's what it says. But I've seen some people, they are growing flowers anyway, just put it out in spoonfuls. Now, they will say, I'm not growing food. I'm not growing food. But when it rains, it gets washed into the soil and it gets washed into the waterways and the entire earth belongs to us. That's just the one thing I want to say about the usage of pesticides. That the pesticides we are using is getting washed into the waterways and the fishes we are eating live in the waters. Those are things for us to consider so that we can try to um, understand and choose how much pesticides and herbicides we want to use because they will get washed away by, by, by the rain. And everything that gets washed away by the rain go into a stream, go into a river, and it's on its way to the, to the seas. It comes back to us in form of our food. And that's why you see some fish having different um, formations on them that didn't used to happen in the past. Those are things for us to consider. Now, when I want to pick the, the next... Okay. The next thing that we want to consider in our garden is leaving the plants without pruning them. Like if you are growing a food garden and you now have a flower garden, because when you are growing a food garden, you will need a flower garden to attract bees. Because apart from attracting bees, for, for your for your food garden, it's very beautiful sight to have lovely looking flowers around, lovely smelling flowers around. To have this, you need to grow the, the flowers. When you have the flowers, maybe roses, dahlias, I can't even mention carnations, so many, many lilies, irises, there's so many flowers. So you can just add all your own. When we have all these plants growing and they are flowering, we want to make the effort to deadhead the, the flowers. Because it's the flowers that you don't deadhead that we usually come along having um, aphids. They will be the ones coming along having mites. They will be the ones that some butterfly will come along and be like, oh, let me lay eggs under this place. So to actually have your garden successfully every year producing large crop, you want to be deadheading the flowers. Not because, oh, I want it to be looking beautiful and fresh, and but because you don't want to create a room for all those ones that want to lay eggs. The bees will not come for dead flowers. And the bees, when they come to your garden, they don't leave any bad 
they come, they pollinate, they make music, and they go away. It's the butterflies that come along, they will dance, you think they're doing a beautiful dance, but they're going to lay their eggs on your plant. And they will try to look for the place where maybe the thing is getting old or is in a corner. You want to make sure you take out dead flowers, the dead heads. You take out those dead roses, those dead uh, beets, the dead leaves. Put them all together and you can bury them maybe in a pot or in the ground somewhere. Because they are not diseased, they are just dead. So, by putting them in the soil, you are tapping into the organic cycle. You return them so your soil will be richer. You return them because they contain nitrogen. Return them to the soil and that soil will be richer. The earthworms will go there. They will feed on it. It's much, much better for us to concentrate our efforts and our time to feeding the earthworms than the butterflies. Because the earthworms give us a positive all the time. But the butterfly, they are like, they will give you, but they will take back. That is what the butterflies do. So you want to deadhead your garden. Yeah. You want to deadhead your garden and make sure there's no room for any butterflies coming along and looking for a place to lay its eggs. Now, what if you don't have um, enough space in your garden? You can think about the plants that you will grow and some will have gone away before the others come in. For example, when I grow tomatoes, I know I will put my tomatoes outside in May. It means my garden bed would be vacant from October to May. So I can grow winter crops like chives, onions out there because they can bear the cold. So I can grow garlic those crops that like to grow in the winter and as soon as summer is coming you have to harvest them in june july because that's when you harvest onions and the garlic then they will be on their way out just before i'm ready to put my tomatoes in so they can overlap a bit but you can manage not having enough space by a sort of using the same bed for different plants. And it's actually very good to use the same bed for tomatoes and onions and garlic because onions and garlic are helping you to drive away pests from the garden soil. And then you come along, you fertilize because you need to fertilize your soil where you want to grow onions and garlic. You also need to heavily fertilize your soil when you want to grow tomatoes. So at each time you want to start your growing, you want to heavily fertilize your soil. But you're using the same soil over and over. There are times, although I try not to dig my garden as in, but there are times I would use some of the soil from my garden bed to just quickly plant a little pot of herbs over the winter. And then I will take this, when those herbs have gone away, I take the soil, put it back in the garden bed, and it goes on growing again. So it's just like you are doing crop rotation by using the same space. When one plant has gone away, you plant something else in there. You can also increase your space, if you don't have space, by vertical gardening. Vertical gardening 
is a way of can have a, a, a wooden thing knocked together against the wall or stuck into the ground and you can put plants plant pots all over this vertical structure just to make sure they are able to receive the sun so you look for the place where they are facing the sun and you can plant your you can plant your extra um, um, produce in there now another thing that we we'll do to maximize our space in a garden is there are certain portions of the garden that is not even for you and it's not for anybody it's just there you can grow something in it and it vines over to your side so that then you can now be the one harvesting the thing but the roots are in a pot on the other side so that's another way of increasing the space that you have for your garden you can grow and let it come to your side one other way as well is if you don't have space the spaces that you are using maybe for composting you can do your composting in ground that is trench composting so that the space you would have used for compost they are now composting in ground. You take the food waste from your household and bury it in the ground. And you would have a pool because you want to know where you've buried some food. You don't want to go and dig up that place again because you soon forget, you soon forget how far you have gone. You keep digging and digging and you would have an entire row where you have completely buried food over a period of one month. This saves you on space for composting if you're actually doing it directly outside in the garden. Then you can now plant directly over your compost. The roots will find the nourishment. So when you plant, the roots will go there. You can just be digging it from one side and putting food in. But there are plants in a row on the other side and they will be receiving the nutrients. It's just a wonderful system of composting when you do that because even the cardboards can be soaked and little bits put in the soil along with the food. The earthworms really love that. So all the cardboards and the papers that you have, you would gradually tear them into pieces, soak them, and put them in the soil. And your plants are growing on the other side. Their roots will find the food resource that they need. And this works very well. When you have a situation where um, space is needed, you can overcome it as well by using outside space. It depends on your manpower, how much you time you will have invested. You can get a, an allotment or a piece of land in somebody's backyard and use it to grow some food. You grow some food there you have your entrance point and the food we are growing is for everybody. So this food will be shared among a lot of people, not just, oh, I'm growing this food, I'm the only one. Yeah, you are growing this food on some people's land. You share the food with them and everybody is happy. Now, one thing that you will notice is that those people too will start learning the gardening, they will start showing interest. And that's actually the main aim of every gardener. We want every other person to actually be interested in growing some food because we all eat. We should all be involved in this. 
food production. We all eat, we all drink things that have been grown on a daily basis. So everybody cannot grow so many things. If, if each person has one thing or the other that they are growing, then it works well for driving away any form of food shortage. And we grow it in a different way. We all learn that, okay, it can be done in that way. And we all come along and copy. When I was talking about growing onions, and I said, my onions that I grow, I just keep harvesting it. And the, the greens, I harvest my onion greens, and I use it for my cooking. And then somebody has now pointed to me, why not grow a lot of onions? That is one secret to growing a lot of onions. When you have onion seeds, when you have onion seeds and you grow it, you can now start to harvest some of them because there's no time for harvesting onion. It's just that there's a time when the onion is going to flower. So you want to harvest before it flowers because you don't want it to flower and the energy that has been stored as the onion bulb is being used to flower. If you're not trying to produce seed, there's no point allowing your onions to flower. So just before the onions will start flowering, they will start falling down. Then you will know that these onions are mature. You want to pull them out of the ground so that they can actually dry over. But what you can do is, when you have your onion seeds, grow a lot. Grow a lot of onion seeds. When they start germinating, start harvesting in about a month's time. Like that amount that I was saying I used to just cut, just harvest that entire onion. But because the onions I grew were not many, I think I grew maybe about 15 or so. So I was just cutting off the top and I just left it there finally. If I just used a large bag or a large container and I'd grown all the onion seeds because I got a lot of onion seeds that I didn't grow because I didn't think about just harvesting it at any time. I was thinking, oh, where will I get the space to put all these onions so I could grow all of them? And I have a lot of carrot, carrots as well. That one has uh, maybe four, four, four thousand seeds. When you get a pack of onion seeds, it will have seeds in the thousands. Grow a lot. And then in about a month's time, come along or put it. That onion will have a little bulb. It will be white. But you can use that onion along with the green leaves. So you use the white bulb below it. You use the onion greens for your meal. So if you start, you be, it will be like you are thinning the onion bed because you can't use all the space in your garden. It's just that small space you will use. You'll be thinning it so that they are no longer overcrowded. You know, like when we were learning and gardening in nature study, and they say, oh, survival of the fittest, pick out the weak, any one that you see that's looking a bit weak, this one is not going to pick them out, have them as your onion to make your dinner for that day. And then go again and harvest and, and, and thin out. So you are thinning out these onions, but you are eating it. Because you are thinning it, you are not throwing it away. So don't grow just the amount of onions that your bed needs. Grow more. Grow like five times more in your garden bed. When you grow a lot of onions, it's coming up. Yes, when you say that just will slow, yes, it will slow it down. But when it's growing and it's coming up, you will start quickly Pinning it, pulling it out, pulling it out, looking at which ones and which ones you should pull out, and you will have onion harvest 
right from the first month after you grow your onion seed. So it's actually more advisable for us to look for proper onion seeds or if it's not onion seeds, then get onion seeds. But for you to go hundreds of onion, like I'm saying, you are going to have to start from onion seeds. So if you grow a lot, as soon as it starts germinating, and you are seeing these green leaves about um, six to eight inches or 12 inches, that's even too long. You just be uprooting it, cut it up, and it goes into your diet. That is one way of having a bumper harvest of onions. And you're going to be harvesting onions until they get to their mature age. You just need to be pulling it out carefully. Make sure you're not um, pulling the ones you don't want to pull. And if anyone got pulled, then pull that one out and use it for, for your meal. Because there's no onion that is too young to eat. It's not like tomato where you say, oh, ah, you can't eat tomato that's not mature because it's green. It's this is that. You can uproot the onion from about four, four, four weeks after growing it, as soon as it's, you see the leaves poking out, I think that's the one they call spring onions. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's the one they call spring onions. It's just a very good way of having onions all year round anywhere in the world that you're growing. Plant a lot of onions, start thinning it out. And which onions do you need again? When you've already got some that you harvested, you can thin it out every other day. And you have onion for use. And if you're not cooking that frequently, thin it out every three days. You have onions for use. So don't wait for, oh, when is this onion going to be big for me to harvest it? Start harvesting your onions just right after four weeks. And it will keep getting bigger. By the time you go back to harvest it, maybe five weeks, you get bigger ones. By the time you go again, you get bigger ones. So don't wait for your onions to be like big, mature. Start harvesting it right from the time you can see just the green onion leaves start harvesting from that stage and you have onion to use year round that is one way and anywhere in the world you can do this you just start growing your onions and you start harvesting it the only thing is you are going to need a lot of onion seeds but then onion seeds are sold in such large parts it's very cheap if you want to buy onion set that's one onion that somebody has grown and it's been uprooted and pack it and then buy this onion set but onion seeds the number of onion seeds that will come up one onion plant will be so many will be so so many so it's just a good point Grow all of them. Start harvesting them right from the time you see that they are. Use them as spring onions. And you are good to go. There's also the leek. It's very much like the onion. When you have the leek flower, after a while, right from the top of the plant of the leek, they will start, they will start germinating. If you have that leek as well, just harvesting it. If you have a lot of the seeds of leek, plant it, start harvesting it. It's just like onion. It can be used in the same way as onion. If you have chives, those ones are thinner, they are smaller. They are actually, the bulbs are almost non-existent. But just the green leaves of chives, you cut that up and you put it in a meal, it's just like onion. It's 
night is the perfect way to to beef up your 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 meal. If you want to have that onion this meal when you're trying to do the fry. So chives, leek, and so many other alliums can be used just like onion, and they work very well. But the onion itself grow a lot of it and start harvesting it right away. That is the best way to having the bumper harvest of onions because you are going to keep keep harvesting onions until you get to the time when the few that are still in the ground start to flower. And you can plant others again if you have more seeds you can keep planting I think the time when you may stop planting onion is when it's close to very hot time. The germination and everything may not work out well. But throughout the time when it is still cool, you can be planting the onions and they will be growing very well. And one good thing about onion is when you harvest them, you just have to leave them to air dry. You string them together, you just tie them together and let them air dry. And you can use this onion for the next one year because the skin will dry and you can use it. But the more mature the onion is, the better it will keep. So if it's very young, that's not going to be among the ones you are trying to string together and keep. The ones you're going to string together and keep are the ones that are mature. You see those ones that you harvested when they are still young? You're going to eat those ones. Not keep them. Because it won't produce that skin that quickly. It's too young to do that. So that's just um, what I have to say about having a successful onion planting in our garden. Now, we have other plants that we also enjoy in our gardens. They may be sh and small shrubs, like um, we have this passion, passion fruits, and so on and so forth. They produce a lot of leaves. We have the cucumbers, we have the melons. They produce a lot of leaves. What we want to consider is creating a sort of a wooden surface for the leaves to lay on so that they are not laying in the bed directly. And this will encourage better fruiting of the plants. I've observed this. When the leaves are not allowed to just be on the ground. You place something. If you're in a place where you can get pallets, that's exactly what I mean. You place the pallets on the ground and let the leaves crawl over the pallets instead of crawling directly over the ground. They will have a better yield because the air can pass through the leaves are dry. When the flowers are being produced, they are better able to face the sunlight and your production is on its way. When you have plants such as that producing a lot of vines, a lot of leaves, you want to concentrate on checking it regularly. Because a lot of times I've seen people, they will just discover one large melon in one corner and one part of that melon has been eaten by by a mole or whatever it is you just see a big hole in it and it's so sad because that would be a very big melon that's just been overlooked one way of having a successful garden all year long is keeping an eye on harvesting our garden, keeping an eye on 
what is on that side because that's um that it's not coming back to eat the rest let's say they actually took the whole of it and went to use it okay they're taking it they want to eat all of it but they will just make a hole in one and ruin it so you can't use it anymore and they themselves unless you have maybe chickens or pigs and then you can feed it to them but that just comes in as a way because it must actually be the biggest it might be the biggest um melon or cucumber that you're going to find in your garden and because it's been overlooked when it got to the point when you're supposed to have harvested it you didn't realize it was there i try to keep an eye on and say okay this one is yeah that one is that one is so as soon as it's flowering try to look out and see if that flower formed the fruit i know it's a bit um of a tedious job but it's exercise walking around your garden and seeing to everything making sure this one is there okay that one is growing there even just walking around your garden is a good way to unwind yourself to not part of the work when you are walking around trying to see what is going to be harvested soon you just take a look the ones that are ready for the harvest you harvest them the ones that are going to be harvested soon you keep them in mind so that you don't need to overlook it now i will talk about um peppers in the case of peppers we need to harvest the pepper very regularly because this sends a message to the pepper plant to produce more. That's just the thing about peppers. You can harvest peppers while they are green and they ripen indoor. That's a good point about peppers. With other fruits, you may want to wait for it to ripen on the plant. It depends on how much of it you need. If you're talking in terms of something like um, tomatoes, you may want to wait for it to ripen on the plant. But when you see your bunches of tomato and the first bunch that's lowest down has a lot of it ripening, but just a few that are still green, I would suggest harvest it and let the energy that the plant is getting be going to the next bunch. Because leaving it there, it means you are stretching the time it's going to take for all the other bunches at the top to start ripening because this tomato will be concentrating on that first bunch it will be ripening maybe two on the next and maybe one on the third one if you actually take it off and it's still summer it's still warm and you bring it inside it will ripen within a week by that time the ones outside you've aided them to ripen faster so it's always a great idea. I used to, in the past, take off my tomatoes and leave the green ones and say I want it to grow bigger. But I've realized that sometimes it's better for me to just cut it off, let the smaller ones just get ripe like that indoors, so that the ones that are still on the plant, you can end your tomato growing season before the cold comes in October. That's if you're living in a part of the world where the cold comes in October because there are some people that are just getting into their summer right now. I'm giving this example as somebody who is living in a place so, so that you get your plants to the end before the cold comes. Because there's really no point leaving just two or three natal tomatoes and saying, oh, they're trying to ripen. It's a big uh, waste of uh, your own strength. Just harvest it, put it in, and take out the entire plant biomass. And stick it in your compost. That's the best way to deal with the plant. When it has used the time when it was young, produced very good foods for you, you put you you let it go away. Wait for the next year. If you know you need more tomatoes than they did, plant more tomatoes the following year. That's just what you need to do. Oh, this tomato, I want it to keep producing until the um, end of October. It doesn't work like that. Because by the time you are waiting for the tomatoes to be producing, 
you won't clear your garden. It's not easy to start planting things in November because it's very, very cold. If you've planted your garden in October when it's still a bit warm, it's getting cold already, but it's still a bit warm. You can still stand it out there. We have a beautiful fall garden. And that's one secret that I just discovered this year. Because before, I too, I would leave my garden and let my tomatoes be ripening. Or out. Now, you need to start your fall garden very early. Start targeting, starting it very early. So that whatever is going to grow in the fall, the nice cool weather is already well established while it is still warm in October. So that you can now be enjoying it in November, December. Examples, something like kale. If you planted your kale in October, it's still sunny enough and cool enough. So the kale will grow, the spinach will grow, the broccoli will grow, so many other green leafy plants. Plant them in October and you get a head start for them as well, just as you got a head start for the tomatoes. And by the time we are now heading towards November, December, they have already given you so much crop. You have excess food that in all year long. Now, if you are a concentrated flower gardener, you should do the same thing as that. You know when each flower blooms, you know the um, daffodils like to bloom very early, followed by the irises, then followed by maybe the roses, then followed by the um, carnations and so many other, so that you continue to see different flowerings. This is what we should be following in creating spaces for our garden. Anyone that doesn't grow and remain till the following year, you put it in its place. If it needs to be moved, then you can grow something else there before the weather changes and you can't put that plant in there anymore. Because it's not going to be starting from seed. You will have started it from seed in another place. You can now bring it out and pluck it into the soil where you took off the other one. There's a lot of plants that decide to flower in the winter or in the fall. We we'll have some roses flower in the winter, but they've been flowering all the way from summer. But then we have these dahlias, they flower in the summer and they carry on into the winter. By the time you have December, you still have dahlias on your plant. There are some that actually come in, like the lilies. A lot of lilies come in, in when it's actually getting cold. They come in October, November, December. Also, that's a good and successful, because some of us are growing these flowers for sale. So that's the good time for us to concentrate and say, I'm growing this plant because this is the period that it chooses to bloom very well. And that's what we do. One thing that I always notice is that we have certain insects that love to come to our plants. With the case of the dahlias, if you have some ladybug beetles that like to play around on your dahlias, then you may want to consider not cutting your dahlia plants or putting them too soon. Or you leave some after you've cut the ones that really, really need to be lifted and brought indoors. You still want to leave some of the food for these um, pests to live on because they are the good um, insects. I mean, they are not pests, but this bug in your garden to all go away. You want them to, to remain and have um, something to feed on. 
don't time for you to uproot your dahlias. It's time for you to take away your sage and everything. If you leave some for the insects to feed on, because that works well for everybody. When we have a situation where we've cleared the whole garden, those insects will just go away and it may be difficult for you to have them the following year. I just feel it's nice if we let them have something to feed on even as the cold weather comes in. We will always have spiders in our gardens, in places where we have spiders. And these spiders, you have a spider web, they're supposed to be killing the pests, but once in a while they may kill a bee. But that's just how nature works. That's the ecosystem. So what I've noticed that a lot of the bees know how to navigate their ways around the spider webs. Some of them may be unfortunate and they get caught, but not a lot. A lot of the bees they fly around the spider's web, <clears throat> go to their own flowers, take their nectar and go away. One thing that I've seen a lot of people do, although I haven't done that yet, is to just have something maybe made with some bamboo or wood and you tie it together so that the bees can go in there and rest. It's called a bug hotel. Now, when the bees are resting close to your garden, because a lot of bees sleep on my plants. And the first time I saw it, I thought the bee was dead. And I, wow. And the bee started flying around, just knocking its head on everywhere. Then I realized that, oh, the bee was sleeping. And then I realized that they actually fall asleep on your on your garden plants. It's a nice sight to see. But if you have the means or the time, I don't know, you can just tie some sticks together so that the bees can have um, somewhere to, to stay in your garden. We'll also have some other pests that come to our garden and we want to discourage them. This may be like the neighborhood dog, the neighborhood cat, or your own personal cat. You want to discourage them from getting into your garden bed because they will spread diseases. Yesterday, I mentioned this and I was getting the word wrong. It's toxo um, plus. Am I getting it? Am I forgetting it again? It's toxoplasmy. To to toxoplasmy, that's what they they spread and you don't want cats coming into the garden having their poop in the garden what you do is mulch when they see no soil they won't even feel like lying on your garden bed and they won't come onto the bed they can walk on the floor they can walk on the ground but they won't get onto your garden bed what i do is i have netting around my garden beds. The netting is just about six inches. I know they can jump it, but it's still a discouragement. It's still a discouragement. When you see a place and you, it's high up, the garden bed is high up, and then there's netting on the edge again, I think they just think, well, look here, let, you know, let us bother ourselves to this uh, bed to, to walk. And they don't go near the garden bed. We also have squirrels and birds coming into the garden. They walk around, they run in the garden bed. The only plants that I want to protect from is the strawberries. I would like them to be kept safe from these organisms. So I have a net, it's called gardening netting. It has a mesh hole of about one inch. You can just spread this when your strawberries start to 
turn, that is while it's still growing, those organisms won't come for it. But when your strawberries start to ripen, you can spread the nets over it. If any squirrel or bird tries to attempt it and it fills the net, oh, they're going to be so terrified, they won't come back and they won't actually succeed even that their first attempt. So once they see that there's a net cover on your garden bed, they will, they will not stay. They will just go away. So that's one sure way of ensuring your garden is successful and your strawberries are not picked by the birds and the squirrels in the neighborhood because they always abound. If they see a place where, oh, there's a lot of food, you will be surprised that there is more and more and more of them that will come along. But once they don't have access to it, the butterflies can't get to your vegetables because of the netting. The birds can't get to your strawberries because of the netting. Everything is undercover and kept safe. Then there isn't any way of them overriding what you're growing. There is one thing called like the 80 20. You can still lose about 20% of what you've grown. Some of them may drop off. Some of them may not mature because of the heat wave. Some of them may just die because an animal walked near it and it broke. There was once my tomato plant broke because I didn't take it properly. I didn't tie it up properly. I was tying it, tying it, tying it, and then it got to a point and I didn't tie it. Then it broke. And there was about um, three new tussles coming at the top. So I just had to make do with the three that were at the bottom because I had six growing on that plant. All those are things that you have to absorb into your garden plan right from the beginning. So if you got 100% of your garden, it should actually be an excess because you should only be expecting maybe 80% of your garden. But if you get 100%, you get more than you expected. And that's a very good yield. You should try to work towards getting 100%, but if you don't, because of the few things that I've said that can happen, the wind can break it because you didn't tie it properly. The insects can lay eggs and not allow it to grow. The squirrels, the birds, they all have their parts to play. You don't get this 100%, but you get up to 80%. Then the gardening has been very successful for that year. You just need to remember that you've taken a lot of substance out of the soil by all the cropping and try to return back to the soil. You need to tap in to the organic cycle. And that is something grows, it dies, it rots. That is, it decomposes. That's why we put food waste in the soil. Because we want it to decompose and then it can help another plant to grow again. So the organic cycle goes on. It's all those living things come to an end, but they aid the growth of a new set of living things in the new season that is coming. We don't actually sit there and observe it, but the composition is happening. Compost is being made, whether we are actively collecting it and making it or not. It's being made continuously. If compost wasn't being made, you won't be able to stand because the whole earth will be full of all the things that had died and didn't decompose. So a lot of people, when they're talking about, ah, housefly, oh, my, 
those are the agents of the composition. They are helping the decomposition along. So when you have them around, they are not so bad because I'm talking about around outside, not around inside your house. They are living their own lives and helping the organic cycle to go on. Because if we killed all those microorganisms, all those insects that help carry out the composition, we are going to have to be breaking down our own uh, items by ourselves. But we better make sure they stay alive so that they can carry on with the decomposition. And after the decomposition, the earthworms can help us eat them up and poop them. And the earthworm poop is the gardener's gold. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate you. You have any questions on how we can have a successful garden? Thank you too, thank you. That was a very good question. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thanks, thanks for all the likes. I appreciate your coming. Have a lovely evening. Bye.